this is Hannah Kane, and I'm here on the day of the Hannah Kane Charity Classic, and I'm very thrilled uh, to announce uh, with the support of our tournament director, Beth Casavant, and our auction and photographer extraordinaire, uh, Melissa pride Foz, that for SYFS, St. Anne's, and Westboro Food Pantry this year, we're able to award $60,000, $20,000 to each of the three charities. We're extremely grateful. Uh, we had Grossman Development Group, who is our presenting sponsor this year. We had uh, 152 golfers out on the golf course enjoying a great day. And we're thrilled to be able to support these three human service groups who do so much work in our communities uh, for the benefit of all of our residents. So thank you for all the work that you thank all you. do thank each you. and every day. Thank you. And, thank you. and thank you for a beautiful day today where it is not hot, it is not raining, it is simply gorgeous. So uh, we're looking forward to uh, another year next year. This is uh, the seventh year of this tournament. Uh, in my name, and uh, we're very happy to be part of a long tradition started by Karen Polito and then Matt Beaton. So overall, this is the 20th year, I believe, of this tournament running and raising money uh, for these three tremendous charities. So thank you all for all you do. Thank you. Thank you thank again. You. So I'm here at hole 13, which is the swindle hole of the golf tournament with the veteran of golf tournaments, uh, Ronnie Bertelli, as well as um, my amazing friend, Tom Gorsuch, who's in his 10th year doing this and tells still me it's going to be. Still a junior swindler after 10 years. Yes, yeah, there's, there's only one way to become the senior one and none <laughs> of us want that to happen, <laughs> so 20, I'm sorry. 21 uh, years. Yeah, I know, 21 years for you. And Sam Beaton, who's making his second appearance at the swindle hole for us. Um, so how's it going today? Have you swindled a lot of money yet out of people? Not really. Not really? No? no. What's wrong with you? Come on. Oh, no. I need you to swindle people. <laughs> Do you I need a lesson? We're, we're doing all right. <laughs> Last year, I took plenty of money. Well, honey? Last year, I took plenty of money. You did. You oh, did. Yeah. You did really well yeah. last year. So, Ronnie, tell us what it takes at the swindle hole. What's the objective here? Well, the first thing you have to be is you have to be very sincere, very honest, and very dedicated. So that covers a little bit of ground. But really the whole thing behind it is it's really the challenge of getting it on the green, which is sometimes very difficult to do for a lot of these golfers. If you do get it on the green and you give us X amount, 5, 10, 20, then we double it, you get that back 10 for 10, 20 for 20. So in the very, very generous people, a few people, fortunately enough, have gotten it on the green. They gotta and, get over the water though, They right? gotta That's get the it over part. the fountain, which is a distraction. So uh, when and if they do get it on the green, then they're still very generous and they donate it back to, to the Hannock Foundation. That's awesome. Well, you have done an amazing job swindling people, yeah, which I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing, <laughs> but we're very grateful because, as you know, the money goes to the three charities yes, that we support, St. Anne's, absolutely. SYFS, and Westboro Food Pantry. Mm -hmm. And, um, Tom, you got um, <laughs> asked... I'm not sure asked is the right word. Uh, you got swindled into being a swindler uh, 10 years ago uh, yes. when Matt held his first tournament. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful that you've been here every year since. Well, thank you. And it's been a fun ride. Fun to uh, hang with, with Ronnie, and now we got Sammy in the mix as well. It's been a great time. Yeah, well, I can't imagine three more perfect people to be out here at the swindle hole. <laughs> and um, Sam, any words of advice for the golfers that are still coming up today on, on how to be successful here? Don't hit it in the water. Perfect. Ah, Pretty simple. Perfect. Yep. Perfect. It's a good Perfect. One. That is the St. Mary's education there, right? <laughs> Telling yeah, you exactly what you need to do. Yep. So, so don't um, do it. well, I thank you all for being a oh, part of a this pleasure, each and yeah. every year. It's enjoyable, you know. I really look forward to it every year, and it's close to great causes. And, you know, being involved with it for as long as I have, way back with Karen back in 2000, you know, how it's grown, how it's gotten, other people have gotten involved, how successful mm. this tournament is. And it says an awful lot for the person with their name on it to carry on, you know, the reputation that it's been. It's one of the most successful golf tournaments, I, w I would say, definitely say, in, in whole Worcester County. Well, you I know, appreciate so. that. But the best part yeah. of the day is not only the fact that we're raising money for three amazing organizations, mm -hmm, sure. but that the people who come year after year are great people who have fun. Mm -hmm. We try and keep it light out here. <laughs> we don't harass them too much in the golf tournament other than mm -hmm. hole 13. Um, yeah, the hole. And everyone always asks when they're registering if they're going to see you guys out oh on boy, the swindle hole because they know <laughs> how many raffle tickets they can buy up front <laughs> as to how much money they're going to get swindled out here. So Terrific. thank you, gentlemen, for all oh, you do. What a pleasure. Thank you, what a right. pleasure. Thanks, Anna.
So I'm here today at SYFS uh, with Executive Director Christine Mowry and uh, Select Woman Beth Casavan, who's also the Tournament Director, as you all know, of the golf tournament. And uh, this is the second year that we have deviated from our original taping a show actually at the tournament because we wanted to really come to the three beneficiary organizations in here directly what's going on. Um, and I know it's been a really challenging uh, year and a half now. Um, and this year, I think in particular, there are some changes in that you can I think, be back in your facility now yes. to see people, which yes. is very helpful. You relied on telehealth for a long time. We um, did. But you've also seen an uptick in the needs, particularly from our young people in town. We have, so record levels. I would say we came back um, into the building on July 1st, which was July 3rd, which was great because we did have many clients that were interested in waiting to come back in person, but we actually had a pretty um, pretty big percentage of clients that enjoyed the telehealth, particularly adolescents. I mm -hmm. think for them, it just you know it's use it's they're used, so used to communicating, yeah. so it's a little easier to open up and talk about really hard things, kind of behind a screen and a little bit removed from another human being. But last spring, um, when the schools went back in full person, we did get a record number of referrals, and even uh, as the fall begins, students are really struggling getting back into the classroom. Um, so we're we are uh, fully anticipating that we will have a very full full fall, even over the summer, which is usually a time for us to reduce our wait list a little bit. We always have a wait list. Mm -hmm. um, we went into this school year with about 87 people on the wait list, and that's mm -hmm. unheard of. And that history of the agency, as long as I've known um, what our wait lists have looked like, it has never been this high. So, And that translates to many, many months. It does. It's about six to nine months right now. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you had asked me a little earlier about our interns. We, you know, we run a, a pretty extensive internship program here that we're really proud of. And we have partnerships with some really wonderful schools. We usually have six or seven. This year we have ten. Um, another one coming on board. They all carry a full caseload. They are all um, having an in-school placement. We have some new partnerships with St. John's this yeah. year that we're really thrilled about and St. Mary's School. She was being on to Sori Alhamra Academy. So it's not only the public schools that we're supporting. We're in all of the schools, which is new for us. And uh, it just is, you know, demonstrative of the need. And I saw, I think you just uh, were at St. John's with all of the educators over there doing we did. these mental health first aid training. We did. And so, yes, yeah, so as you know, um, we did receive some state funding for our mental health first aid program. So thank you for your advocacy for that. And that's a program that you know how deeply I care about that. And I think it's probably the, one of the more impactful things that we do, just teaching lay people how to recognize a young person that may have a budding mental health or substance use problem and, and how to support them. So yes, St. John's um, had their first training and we trained 45-ish of the educators there and we will be back there throughout the course of the year doing several more trainings as, lo as well as many other districts across the state. Well, and I think that's something probably people don't realize. Um, the money that we um, have gotten for you through the state budget for youth mental health first training, you're training people all across the Commonwealth. Yeah. It's not just for Shrewsbury. No. And you've literally been um, everywhere. Everywhere. Um, which is one of the ways <laughs> that I sell it to all my colleagues is I show them the list of all the places you've been and all the places that want you to come, but yes. you need funding in order yeah. to do that. So really from Gloucester to the Cape to out in Western Mass, Springfield, we are all over the place with that program and we're, we're edging up on 4,000 people trained. So that's making a really big impact. And also with Boys and Girls Clubs, I think even Department of Children and Families should yes. have done training with them. Even the with DA's the office. Yes. And we are all over the place with this program. And because there are so many population modules, it's you know for adults helping young people, it's for adults supporting one another, for adults supporting older adults. You know We know that older adults uh, have a really high prevalence too of mental health and behavioral health and sub substance use issues, and it's not a normal part of aging. So we frequently see people sort of writing it off, and older adults as, oh, they're getting old, but it really is not normal, and it's treatable at any age. So, And I think that's something we've paid a lot more attention to here in Shrewsbury, and, and you've been a part of that, um, together with Christine, looking at the needs of our older adults, and we've increased some funding um, through the town budget for that. Yes, um, and it's been... Uh, a process, right? There was a, a, a needs assessment that was done in our senior population and really found that what you're saying is is very accurate, that there are many unmet needs in the senior population that people might have thought of as just part of the aging process. And the town has been trying to put additional resources in the form of people to help um, with the caseload and to manage the outreach to seniors. And it it was ongoing even when town offices were closed for the pandemic. And now that things are opening up you know, you see even more the need that people um, have in accessing mental health resources or substance use resources. Um, so in the town appropriated budget, we're able to uh, 
um, put $150,000 toward SYFS for the clinician. But again, um, we could probably put another $150,000 toward SYFS and still have a wait list. Well, I think, unfortunately, Beth, we were already in a mental health pandemic before COVID-19 mm -hmm. happened. And so to add that burden onto an already under-resourced um, behavioral health care system, and I'm not talking just here, everywhere. It's that's, everywhere. That's, mm -hmm. And arguably, Massachusetts has, we're up there as, mm -hmm. you know, I think top three behavioral health care in the country. So, uh, you know, it was already, though, a burden system where there's a shortage of professionals and, uh, you know, everybody's feeling the impact. So we're trying to work really creatively. Actually, some of the money from this tournament that Hannah sponsored um, will be put towards uh, better supporting the school, so we're putting some more resources over to our school-based services because we are getting lots of referrals that are uh, sort of bubbling up through the school clinical teams uh, for kids that have more acute and complex needs. Sure. Um, and then we're working on some sort of crisis response plan for the town because what's happening is folks are calling us and saying, you know, my son or daughter is uh, talking about suicide or self-injuring, and, and we're having to say, okay, we'll put you on the list and call you in nine months. Well, that's egregious, and we right. don't ever want to do that. So we're hoping to work with the town to put something in place where we can say, okay, you're on a wait list here. We'll put you on wait lists in other places as well. But in the interim, we can give you six appointments right now in the next two weeks um, for stabilization, for some skills building. Mom and dad are going to do this. Child is going to do this. So, you know, we're hoping that will help a little bit. Um, to reduce the crisis for just crisis. It's so needed because yeah. mm -hmm. uh, we have a huge um, burden in our hospitals of um, boarding in the ER because yeah. there are no beds um, for any of our um, younger um, pediatric through um, teenager population that has need. Um, and so we're seeing it. It's an issue that we're talking about on the state level all the time. Um, and you're right, it is also a crisis because we just don't have enough providers. Right. We don't have enough people who can provide the service to everyone who's needed, so we need to get really um, thinking about what are the interim ways in which we can help people. Um, because when you make that call and you need help, you need help. Right, and you probably like, needed help right. a long time prior, ago. Right. and it's just gotten to the point now where, right, and it, it, you're saying a nine month wait, I've heard families getting told a year. Oh yeah. In a year when you have a child in crisis, and you're that right. impacts your whole family. Nobody calls us and says, oh, I think there might be something going on. By the time people work up the nerve to make this phone call, which is a tough one, um, yeah, we're usually way beyond, even sometimes outpatient treatment, way beyond the, the level of care that even we can offer here. Well, thank God they have um, you all to call because um, this agency has never been stronger. It's never been better led. Um, it's never had a better um, group of staff people committed to all of the work, um, the interns, it's so wonderful to see them um, and, and they're getting such valuable um, opportunity from the ability to be part of this and also to use what they're learning um, directly practicing uh, with people who are in crisis um, and yet you're, all those good things in terms of staffing it's also um, a time when this agency has grown and we have to keep up our, our budget, which we know, and that's yes. a challenge. And we rely a lot on fundraising. We, we have the, um, the money from the town, which is tremendous, and we've been trying to increase that the last mm -hmm. few years, and we'll never stop working on that either. Um, but you know, this is an agency that needs to be supported by all residents of the town um, helping out. And so uh, we're happy to be able to provide this 20,000, but we also wanna make sure that people are continuously aware that the agency is in need of additional financial assistance. And so people should um, donate. They can go right on your website and, and donate. On our website, time. our annual appeal is coming up just right around the corner. That goes out in October. We're hopefully going to have our gala in the spring. Um, and alongside that, we'll probably also do another online fundraiser for folks that can't make it to the gala to support us. But you're right, our, our revenues and our expenses have tripled over the past few years. So uh, we're, we're definitely providing so many more complex services than we used to because it's in response to the need. So and in addition to all the good work that you do here, you spend a ton of time out there talking to businesses and donors trying to do. solicit additional support. And you've brought um, some new folks on this year, which is great, new companies. Yes. Um, but uh, I, I think it's easy for people in town to not realize that um, your ability to provide services depends on all of us being part of that. I think uh, people always think, oh, someone else pays for it or that, you know, the town covers it. And the reality is uh, we need more people to financially support the always. good work of the agency. So. And thank you so much for your continued support and your continued support. We're really grateful to be in a town that puts so much emphasis and cares so much about 
the people who live here. So we really appreciate your support. Thank you. Well, you don't go anywhere. You stay here. You're a critical <laughs> part of this, uh, this work. And also just wanted to note that uh, Melissa Pride Boz, who's also worked uh, with us on this tournament ever since we started uh, doing it when I got elected, uh, taking it over from Matt, uh, has also been board chair at she SYFS has. and done a tremendous amount of work. She's doing work 24 hours a day. I think I don't know when she sleeps. Um, she doesn't. But really want to acknowledge all that she continues to do and um, celebrate her. She's coming to the end of her term. And she is. Um, I think we've managed to suck her in to stay on for a little <laughs> bit because we never let go of anyone <laughs> contributing. Um, but uh, it really is a monumental effort to support this agency and it takes the hard work of a lot of people. Um, so thank you it for does. all that you do. And thank you too. Great. So we are here at St. Anne's uh, with the 8,000 year old woman who uh, <laughs> just keeps on going. Uh, you are a miraculous woman, Elena Blank. Thank and, you. Uh, Beth and I are constantly talking about how you're our idol. Uh, you just are the woman who never stops. And so hopefully we will have this amount of energy uh, when we are approaching will. <laughs> this period of time in our lives. But um, we wanted to come here and talk a little bit today about the changes that you've made here at St. Anne's in the last year and also to help people understand that the need is still extremely high and you're seeing higher numbers of people than uh, prior to the pandemic and um, mm -hmm. to share with us some of that information. So since we were here last year, when we were outside taping last year, because you ran the operation outside last year when people were coming to get food, right. um, two changes have happened. You're back inside and you've shifted to just doing the food now and moving away from having the thrift shop. Correct. What drove that decision for you? First of all, the supplies were getting harder and harder to get to get stock for the, for the uh, thrift shop. And the time between deliveries was extremely far apart, number one. And you couldn't get the quantity, which meant that we had we were paying for storage that was a wasted expense. You were paying for transportation. A lot of things that were very costly that were not producing what we had hoped to. Plus, we could see that the food was becoming the most important thing down here, not the clothing, although the people missed that, you know, and also missed the friendship. However, we had to concentrate on the space that we had and give it the most important thing that we could do with it. And where we already had the shelving in, and the food bank has been uh, suggesting this choice pantry for a long time, but you have to have a facility in order to use it. I, and I think the team has done a tremendous job. If you look around, um, they have everything that they people could want. So they come into this with the dignity of, of shopping on their own, filling their own basket with what their family that they, they want to use, not something that they don't want. I mean, you can look around and there's some things that are gluten-free. We have a gluten-free section. So. And, you know, not everybody would want that or use right. it. You have a lot of product that perhaps would be ethnic for one family and wouldn't be for another. Yeah. So with all this area, we were able to do this. And we even have a special section out, out front for our four-legged friends, for mm -hmm. our cats and dogs. And we occasionally get uh, donations of dog food and cat food. So we do have uh, a spot out there just for them. We also have a personal care selection with shampoo and toothpaste. So, and that area gets cleaned out faster than we can fill it. Mm -hmm. That is one of our most expensive things that we try to stock, as you know, and they can't get that or they can't get paper products with food stamps. Yeah. So hopefully we're able to free up enough of a budget that everyone has by giving them this, selecting these foods that we have, and then they might have a little extra to buy their products that they need that are not covered by food stamps. We have a wonderful team that works on this. We have a gentleman that does inventory control. It's like he could run a supermarket. He does such a good job. We also have another area in the back where we have backup stock. And then as you can see underneath here, we have all the stock. And as we run out of stock on the shelves, as people come in and they do their shopping, it's stocked immediately so that it, there's always something there of the same product. Um, so when do people come now? Do you have certain hours um, they, that right, people can come and shop? Right now, we, we still are going with, we have Monday, when, Monday, we actually sometimes Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, uh, 
Melinda is in the process of getting together some kind of an operation or an appointment system that this block of people will come on this day. Sure. Because with the pandemic, we're still, everybody has to wear masks down here still. And you want to keep it so that there's no more than four or five people shopping at the same time. So in order to do that, you really have to space it out. And it takes some of the people can shop in 10 minutes, but just like yourself, when you go to the store, sure. you pick it up and maybe you look at the salt content or whatever you might do. And uh, so we're looking forward to the day when we'll be able to have them come in whenever they want to have people have it staffed so that people can call and make an appointment. If they're out of food, naturally they come in any time at all. Sure. The fresh fruits and vegetables, we are still processing them outside. Um, and so when they shop, finish shopping here, they simply go out to our outside people and they can select their fresh fruits and vegetables. And they love that. Our meat will take you into the kitchen afterwards and we have two beautiful new big commercial freezers thanks to uh, Hannah Kane's reference and the uh, grant that we got during COVID which helped enable us to get those and that has helped. And, uh, and that's a good example of um, use of the federal dollars that came down to the state absolutely. in order to help. Um, absolutely. I think it's helpful for people to see that um, it wasn't just food product but it was ways right. to support food pantries yep. in terms of a longer term investment in supporting people and so those it was a wonderful I mean, it was a wonderful uh, idea in it we implemented to make sure that whatever we did with that money was going to provide for the future of yeah. this program and uh, enabled us for better storage so that we don't have to turn down anybody that says well I've got 10 turkeys and can yeah. you take them and if you just have a small you know regular household I mean how many turkeys can you put in your right. home freezer so this this was a fantastic uh, opportunity. We still plan to get a um, refrigerated, more of a commercial one where people can look in and see what we have in the other eggs. Right now we have the eggs there and we have them in a freezer in the kitchen and a freezer out there so they're brought out when the people are shopping. Uh, and the same with the cheese and the milk and some of those other products. Uh, when people come in here, Elaine, I know when they go to Westboro, um, to the food pantry, mm -hmm. who also implemented um, this method, yes. um, there's sort of uh, guidance in terms of how much to take relative to making sure there's enough for everyone. Do you have that same principle here, or is it... Um, right now, she has, um, I think we only have a couple of items that we have a limit on. Sure. We have milk and peanut butter. Um, we have suggested that they only have a limited number of those. But as you can see now over there where the peanut butter is, we have since replenished that stock. So yep. um, I think that sign is gone. I can't see that far. Because you you're, you're serving, I think you just told me, there was 506 um, there was, households yeah, I had them up. There was 506 families, that, uh, service families that came in during the month of August. They, this is the report we give to the Worcester County Food Bank that shows how many people were serving and uh, it's broken down actually to age groups and this helps them when they're doing their buying or their soliciting for various items. It's very helpful to them and that translates into 1,335 people that were actually helped during that period. Now in that number some come twice, they may come three times, but we're talking about it was 506 visits so the family visits. Um, we also keep track of, of what, what kind of employment they have, the ages, so we know we have a, a large number of, I think elderly, over 65, 165 people have signed up. So that's, now that's quite expensive, it's quite, I think a lot for the elderly, but. And we talked about that over the course of, um, during the pandemic, because certainly early on, there was a challenge of, you know, how do we supply food to people, mm -hmm. especially given some of the volunteers were in an age bracket that was, um, you know, noted to be very careful mm -hmm. because of the consequences of the, the disease. Um, but we talked um, several times, um, not only us working together at the town level, um, but bringing in the senior center and having Holly be part of that conversation and really thinking through, mm -hmm. are we serving um, our older population here in Shrewsbury to the degree that we need to? You know, and right. where are the gaps and what do we need to do? And you're still working on that. I yes. know Melinda has um, had many conversations with Holly yes, uh, in regards to getting getting a better handle on, you know, getting them to where it's needed. 
I, and I, even during COVID, I was amazed that uh, as we got referrals from the state, that people were we were actually delivering to the household. Mm -hmm. Now, then didn't go in; they just went to the doorstep. But nonetheless, uh, I think the state did a fantastic job uh, of notifying my husband and I both happened to have gotten COVID. And uh, the state, they do ask you, you know, do you yeah. have access to food? Do you need any help? Uh, it was a very well, very well thought out, put together schedule. And the fact that our group here was able to deliver at home, I just think was amazing. I just, I don't know how they did it, but they did. Just leave the food on the doorstep? Leave it on the doorstep. They, they were called and there was a time they said, we will be there, you know, probably by 11 o'clock or around 11 o'clock and ring the door and leave. And in those cases, there was special uh, Melinda, even, I mean, she would say, is there anything else that you need, you know, while I'm coming, I, we can get it for you. So that, you know, if they couldn't get out, say, to get toilet paper, I mean, she would just pick it up and bring it over at the same time. I mean, so it was uh, terrific. The governor and the lieutenant governor had pulled together um, in April of 2020 a food security task force, and I served on it. Um, and one of the things that we focused on um, was the food supply to people mm -hmm. who were um, having to be at home or quarantined mm -hmm. and making sure. And, and again, in the midst of a pandemic, sometimes it's a great opportunity because things that yeah. seemed like a barrier before, you just broke through because you you had the impetus to do that. Yeah. But I think we've seen some of the things that, that were forced because of the pandemic are now things that we're going to figure out. How do we adopt these on an ongoing basis and recognize that you know there are people sometimes who can't get to a food pantry to right. get food, but who right. Um, have no other access um, yeah. and so there's a lot of work uh, part of that is also you had mentioned before the um, electronic benefits the SNAP um, yes. program for supplemental food you know now uh, those can be used online um, mm -hmm. and just recently stop and shop uh, was one of the first uh, to adopt that as well as Walmart and Amazon but mm -hmm. again recognizing that when people get those dollars we want to make sure that they can get out and use them uh, in their monthly allotment and and I know in town, uh, you focused a lot of your work, Beth, uh, in making sure that our support organizations in town uh, had what they needed. Right. No, definitely. I know Melinda called early on in the pandemic just looking for masks that yep. they could wear, the volunteers could wear, you know, to be able to keep the food distribution going. And I know exactly. that um, our, our Deputy Fire Chief, Seth Colby, was right away. Yes, yep. we have some in here. And, and so there is a great partnership between the town and, and St. Anne's because you are providing that safety net for our residents. I think the whole town, I have to say, we're, we're very fortunate to live in Shrewsbury because the cooperation between all of the agencies, uh, Shrewsbury Youth and Family Services, your uh, home, the elderly, I mean, it, it's in the school nurses, I mean, the whole town works together. I know we, we interact with all of them. I know Evelyn does at Christmas time. Yeah. We're still gonna do Christmas as we've always done it again. Even that has changed because of COVID, we, we used uh, gift cards. Mm -hmm. uh, this year, we're, we're still going to do it in cooperation with the school nurses. Everyone will work with them mm -hmm. and to make sure that the children will all be covered you know, who need it. And we're hoping to get coats for all of them and boots. So that will be something that we'll be looking for. We've already started brand new ones. And uh, so working together, you know, it'll get done. How can people support seniors in town? You know, we were just at SYFS and we were talking about the fact that that's an organization that always needs financial support from people who live in our community because fundraising is mm -hmm. a huge portion of their budget. Um, how can people support St. Anne's? The same, the same way as they have in the past. We no longer have the money from the um, thrift shop. But, you know, when you don't have the money from the thrift shop, you can apply for grants. Uh, which is one one way that you can ask for money, yeah. and then with the town residents, like a helping one on one, uh, a gift card, or maybe if the word goes out that we want coats or we want whatever, maybe they could take call and, and get uh, an, a name, a first name, and size of a child that would need a coat, need a coat. And you said I think personal products too, or something. Personal that products are something we absolutely, it. you know, if somebody would like to have a personal uh, product drive. That would be absolutely fantastic because when we try to provide uh, hip, you know, shampoo, toothpaste, toothbrushes, any kind of laundry products or paper products, they cannot get those with the food stamps. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just not possible. So that inventory, if you look at that section when we have it, that gets wiped out immediately. And there we do suggest that they take, 
you know, uh, like one bottle of shampoo sure. or whatever that, uh, so that there is enough for everybody. But that can turn into a very expensive proposition when we go out to buy it because they don't have that product ready or available at the food pantry. And, and can people pantry. also donate if they wanted to um, provide a check to you for support? Absolutely, um, yeah. They can do that as well. And we are a 501 c yeah. so it's fully tax deductible by law. Uh, we will issue a receipt, and we usually give receipts anyhow when we get checks, uh, acknowledging that we are a 501 c You are an extremely well-run organization. Definitely. There is, um, I mean, obviously you look around, you see how well organized it is, but you have information at the drop of the hat anytime anyone comes. Um, mm -hmm. You don't just provide them food, but you also provide guidance and help and ideas, because um, a lot of people look to you and the other volunteers here for assistance mm -hmm. and other pieces of their lives, and you're just, you're truly remarkable, and... Well, we try. Mm -hmm. You know, we try, and it, it's important. You don't think of them, uh, to why, I don't think of them as clients. I think of them as neighbors and friends. They are. And part of our family, because basically we're all family, and family wants to help one another. So when you, when you, when people come in, they want to be greeted, they want to be, it, it's okay to be here, you know, I'm not embarrassed to be here. I'm here because, you know, I just need a helping hand right now. And I think that's very important, and this program really accentuates that. Well, that. I should also note that I'm standing here with two of the, um, what well, was called Ung San Heroin when you were awarded it at the Commonwealth. <laughs> it's now called Commonwealth Heroin, um, and rightly so, because you're two amazing women who do so much for our town. And as I said, Elaine, you know, Beth and I just think you are absolutely amazing and uh, really give us um, hope for being uh, active and productive people, right? Definitely. Um, We're lucky to have you girls coming up because I, I am getting old. I am. No, There's no question about that. I have lots of white hair. Yeah. Anyway, you, there's a lot going. of people with white hair after the <laughs> pandemic. Um, but, but thank you for all that you do and your team and Melinda and Evelyn. Um, really, it's just amazing what you're able to do. Mm -hmm. And I think, I and I hope that what people heard in the conversation is there is tremendous need in our community. Yes, this is. is not somebody else's community. This is our community. And we need to make sure that we're doing all we can to support everything that you all do here. So thank, thank God we got people like you too. Well. And your dogs. I always watch the dogs. <laughs> she still has her hamster as her screensaver <laughs> on her phone. No giving away the hamster. Screensaver. I buried that hamster <laughs> several years ago now. So very traumatic. Gotta take care of our pets. <laughs> when my dogs don't like something, I and I have the bags of food left over because they're extremely picky. I will stock your four-legged pantry. Thank you very much. Pantry. Thank you very much. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you, Elaine. Thanks, Elaine. You're welcome. So I'm here at Westboro Food Pantry, uh, surrounded by uh, so many donations of food that are going to help people in Westboro, yeah. and with three wonderful people, um, Phil and Donna Kittredge and Doc Green, um, who are instrumental um, in the food pantry. And thank you so much for all the work that you do here to support so many people in Westboro. Um, we, the last two years, we've been coming around because we actually want to show people the good work that you're doing inside um, the food pantry. And I know that in the last uh, year and a half, you've had to make a lot of pivots in the way that you've been able to support people. And I know we talked last year about what you were doing, and it was still a very different period of time than it was before the vaccine was available. And um, But I know that you've changed things this year, too, and that you're now uh, able to support seniors at home who are, are not mobile to get out and to come and doing some at-home deliveries. And so I'd love to hear um, an update on, on what it is that you're doing and, and how you're able to support the Westboro community as strongly as you do. Okay, well, what we noticed was, and I, when we were looking at our weekly figures, we noticed a big drop off in seniors. We, we open a special day just for seniors. They can come any day, but there's a special day restricted just for them. And we noticed the numbers dropped, you know, went from 35 to maybe 10 or 12. And when we started doing some checking, tried to find out why, seniors were very apprehensive about coming in with, sure. with, um, with COVID. Um, so what we did was um, we talked about with our volunteers and we got uh, three or four sets of volunteers that were willing to deliver the food uh, right to the, to the apartment mm -hmm. complex or the houses where they live. We got another group of volunteers who are willing to fill all the bags, and what we and what we do also is we give them a shopping list, yeah. and they fill it out every week of what they are looking for. So those volunteers fill all the bags, and then on Tuesday morning, we put all the meats in them right out of the freezers, and then 
all the volunteers show up and, and distributed them. We're distributing to 26 or 27. We had 27 this past Tuesday. Yeah, 27 seniors. Um, out of our 50 seniors, 27 of them are getting home delivery um, for a bunch of reasons. Some of them have mobility issues. Sure. Some of them have vision is issues. You know, they, they, they can't drive and they yeah. really can't see. Um, and others are just very uncomfortable, you know, coming out because of COVID. So that's, yeah. that's new. Um, in addition to that, we were doing um, COVID deliveries uh, with, with a contact tracing collaborative. Yeah. They'd call us and tell us that this family's in, you know, isolation, so we need to deliver to them. So we would deliver, and the local board of health, same thing. They'd tell us that this family is in quarantine, so we would deliver um, about 50 pounds of food to them. You know, frozen meats and. I'm really glad to hear you talk about that, and it's something that <laughs> earlier Elaine LeBlanc was also mentioning at St. Anne's. A lot of people don't see some of the ways in which contact tracing was working. Yes. Um, you know, and unless you actually had COVID and you got a call, you don't necessarily understand the significance of it. Yes. But it really was to make sure that those folks were not just understanding who they might have been in contact with, but how to support them, knowing they had to be in quarantine and were ill. And so this is a great example of that. And I would say out of the, the 35 or 40 deliveries we did, only a couple of them were actually our clients. These were people that you know, had jobs and sure. had the means, just they just weren't able to go out. Yeah. So it worked out great for everybody. So. And I know that um, it's certainly a very physical thing when you're preparing all the things that you need to go drop off and, and getting everything ready here. But there's also a ton of paperwork. And I know, Donna, that's one of the things I think you spend an enormous amount of time on. And again, it's something that probably most people just don't know about or think about as part of this process. but. Tell me what it's like on the paperwork end. Like, what are you reporting and to who? What do they need to know? Uh, I have to report to the Worcester County Food Bank, uh, all the food that comes in from Stop and Shop. We have to keep track of every pound of food that comes in. Yeah. Um, I write up for grants. Uh, thank you notes for everybody that donates. And you're very, very quick on that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, certificates of appreciation. If somebody's been donating to us, for you know, an extended period of time, you know, I think they need to get more than a thank you note. So I send out a certificate of appreciation to them. And, and you'll see them in some of the businesses around town. They're very uh, proud of that. They post them right on their walls. You guys are so organized. You're uh, so efficient. Your meetings when I've come to visit you at them. I mean, I, I think people are, you know, they should understand it by looking around here how organized it is. But that translates to everything that you do and. I'm always amazed at how many people are at your meetings and are part of your volunteer network and wanting to support. And then certainly you have the groups like the Boy Scouts doing the canned food drive and you know, so much of the community is supportive of the work here. It is and it goes, it, it's not just the Boy Scouts or the post office, the postal yeah. carriers. We have a new organization, the, the Appalachian Service Project here in Westboro. Uh, they coordinated um, four food drives for us last wow. year, and between the four food drives, they brought in over 20,000 pounds of food. Um, and one of the food drives we actually asked them to do was for personal products, because yeah. a lot of things, what people don't realize, e even if you have SNAP benefits, you can't even buy deodorant or toilet paper or toothpaste. It's strictly food. Yeah. So we, organized, we asked them to do a uh, drive just for personal products and almost 4,000 pounds wow. of those products. Everything from shampoo to deodorant, toothpaste, toothbrushes, toilet soap. paper, bar soap. It, just it's, tremendous. And that'll that'll take care of us for a year. Oh, that's wonderful. And I know you, last year you were showing me upstairs with all the, there had just been a drive and it was all upstairs. And so you do have a lot of flexibility in this building to be able to store um, for that length of time. And, and that's due to two groups. It's due to the Board of Selectmen that gives us tremendous support and the town manager. Yeah, um, absolutely. Both of those organizations, the Selectmen and, and Christy, are very supportive of the food pantry. Whatever we seem to need, you know, uh, go ahead, go do what you need to do. Um, we're the only uh, full-time, you know, organization in this building. So we've taken it among ourselves to make sure that the building, the inside keeps painted and the lights wall work and we take care of the minor maintenance because we're the ones that are using the building and it's really kind of unfair to expect the town to put the bill for something that we wear out. Well and you guys, we were talking about this earlier, um, 
you seek grants and have been very yes. successful in that. We've gotten you some money through the state. I think the um, the air conditioning yes. money, I think, yes. that yes. Senator Eldred yeah, yes. has filed um, in the Senate budget when we're working on it. So, um, but again, that takes effort and diligence to follow up on those things and to apply for them. So mm -hmm. really, credit to all of you. Um, and then your volunteers extend themselves like DOT here and get involved in other ways to help support. DOT's an integral part of our um, golf tournament, the planning committee. Let me, let me tell you what else DOT does, because she's very modest. She goes to Stop and Shop three times a week, sometimes four. At 6.30 in the morning, quarter to seven, she arrives, and then she goes into the big coolers out back, and she and you can see Dot, because Dot's the one that's hauling one shopping cart full of frozen or uh, cooled frozen vegetables veggies. in one cart, and she's towing another one behind her. And all of that stuff needs to be all packed into banana boxes and then brought out. She brings it up, puts it in her car, brings it up here, and then puts it away. So, and she's here every single Tuesday and Thursday, without fail, sorting the food. Well, she um, just got excited with the drop-off, saying, now I know what I'm going to do tomorrow morning. Oh, so, yeah. I mean, oh, that's, that's, a, that's another day she's going to come in. Like, yes. Um, but, so, no, it's really miraculous, um, the investment that you make uh, into you. the community. And certainly, um, again, doing it just behind the scenes and because it means something to you and you know it, it means something to the people. But I really want to thank you, Dot, for all the work that you do as part of our host committee. Uh, she's out there. What more can I do? You know, can I help you set up? Can I help do this? Um, and you're always there volunteering all day long. Uh, no matter what we ask you to do, you're out there doing it with a smile, which is beyond me. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, you're really all unsung heroines and heroes because this work is a, a passion of the heart. Like, you could be doing other things in retirement and you choose to do this and to support the community, all of you. And um, I, I know that the community is grateful. I know they recognize that. Um, but we certainly want to make sure that you, each and every one of you hear it often. And I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity to be able to be a small part of what you do here. And certainly all of the sponsors and the donors and the golfers are so appreciative. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of people that tell me they can't find golfers, they can't find donors for their golf tournaments. And because of the three charities that we support, people come out of the woodwork um, because they know how much of a difference you make in people's lives here in Westboro well, and in Shrewsbury. Well, your golf tournament makes a huge difference here and not everybody knows what we do with your donation. Mm -hmm. Your donation is earmarked every year um, to purchase um, local coupons. vegetables. Yeah. We, we, ha we supply each one of our clients with a coupon that every single week starting in July going through all the way through the end of September. Every week they get a coupon and then go to three of the local farm stands and get fresh vegetables every week. And that's, it's really, really tr tremendous. We couldn't do that without the golf tournament, and thank you. Yeah, well, it's also tremendously meaningful to me because not only are the people being supported, but as a um, chair of the Food System Caucus with one of our priorities around food insecurity and another priority around supporting local agriculture, that is the perfect match of those two things. And so I'm really grateful for the support of the local agricultural community. I think that's, um, again, it's something that not a lot of food pantries have thought to do something like that, and I think it's a tremendous use of the dollars. So you're benefiting not only the people who are gonna get access now to the fresh fruits and vegetables and mm -hmm. produce, but you're benefiting somebody who lives uh, in the area, um, boosting uh, the economic value to them because they are able to, a lot of times, um, sell more produce to people that might not have even ever thought of going to a farmer's market. Mm -hmm. So you're supporting them with these dollars and then they're likely to go back and support them on their own as yep. well. So, well, we we've started a similar project. We did it first with the uh, Westboro House of Pizza. Um, we worked with them and set up. A, we gave our clients a voucher, and depending on how many people in the family, they go one, two, or three ten dollar vouchers, and allow them to go to the House of Pizza with their family um, to get you know lunch or to get a pizza to go, or and just made them one more thing that uh, made them feel more like everybody else, you know, they could do that. And and it was nice because it was, again, a local, private, you know, yeah. small family-run business. We're going to be doing the same thing, um, we hope, with South Street Diner oh, this fall, same thing. Um, so you'd be surprised how many of the seniors go to a lot of the, they used to all go to McDonald's and on Sunday mornings. Queen. And Dairy Queen, yeah, we've done it with Dairy Queen. We provided <laughs> gift coupons yeah. to Dairy Queen. so. 
Um, it's just one other little thing that we can that we're luckily we're able to do. If people um, want to support the Westboro Food Pantry, what is the best way for them to support you? What do you most need? Um, we're always we're always accepting uh, gift cards if you know if, if uh, fresh food or I should, not fresh food but for food that's within date. Yeah. We do get a lot of food that's um, donated that is expired, especially when somebody's cleaning out a house. Sure. Well. And we we just won't we can't give that out. So yeah. gift cards are ideally the best. That this woman that I registered today, a senior, that had no food in her house. Mm -hmm. We were able to give her five um, gift cards today to, to stop and shop. That's great. So that um, she could go down. As soon as she left here, she left here with some food, but then she could go down and buy what she needed because she's uh, um, she can't eat anything with gluten. It has to be all gluten free. So a specific diet. We don't always have the foods that she needs here, but she can go to the grocery store and get exactly what she needs now. One of the other things that you all do, which I think is so critically important, is when somebody comes to you, you also make sure they're aware of the other resources to yes. them to support. Mm -hmm. And so I know that you um, inform people about the SNAP, the Supplemental um, Nutritional Assistance. And WIC. Yeah. We, we make sure that Great. part of them, are, they're, they're concerned that, well, when I ask somebody, do they get it? And they say no, and I say why? Well, they're afraid it might hurt their immigration status. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, they're afraid it may hurt their social security benefits. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why, and some of them just don't like. They don't like to give out their personal information yeah. because they they might not be in the country legally. Yeah. Um, we don't we don't know. We don't care. Right. You know, you come in, you live in Westboro and you need food. Yeah. We'll take care of you. But I can see why there's a there's an issue. So. Um, that's our job is to try to get them as much of the benefits as, they, as we can. Well, we really appreciate that because it's a, you know, as you know, some people there's also a stigma to it, and and yeah. some people believe that they may have tried once but not have been qualified to get it. But situations change, and so one of our messages is always go back and see if you qualify now. You know, it doesn't if you didn't qualify at one time because your income was too high. If your situation has changed, try again. Well, well, well with the new guidelines that they've just issued, really effective in July, yes. it doubled the income. So whatever their income was last time they came, it's it's more than doubled. Well, and a ton so. of credit goes to Congressman McGovern, who does amazing work fighting yep. for um, all issues related to hunger. Um, and he's done a tremendous job advocating for those increases. And, and that's an example of where all levels of government are working towards the same thing. You mentioned the town and the support of those selectmen and the town manager here. Certainly at the state level, we're doing what we can. At the federal level, they are because everyone recognizes that no person should be hungry. And nope. So thank you for all that you do. Well, it's a pleasure. Thank you. We'll be back thank again you. next year, hopefully, in the eighth year of the tournament. And um, you showed me earlier, you keep all your signs. Um, yes, we do. Each year yes. that you have, um, you're very gracious in doing one for the food pantry and noting uh, people who have contributed greatly. Um, and you informed me today you've got room for 11 more signs. So yes, I, yes. <laughs> I've got 11 more years at least to yeah, go. We're not so. going to quit until Doc gets her 15-year pin. <laughs>